Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Queen Mary. Welcome to the School of Politics and International Relations, and welcome in particular to Kim's inaugural lecture. I'm David Williams, the head of the School of Politics and International Relations, and it's my great pleasure to have been asked to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Kimberly Hutchins. I don't want to say too much, uh, obviously you've not come to listen to me, um, but to Kim. But I do want to say a few things by way of introduction. The first thing to say is some thank yous. Um, the idea behind this lecture, one we had uh, last semester and others to come, uh, was Sophie's idea, so a thank you to her. Um, and a big thank you to Tamida, who's in the back, and the other members of the PS team for organising this evening. It's all very much appreciated. And obviously a big thank you to Kim for agreeing uh, when asked by Sophie to, to give this evening's talk. And of course, a thank you to all for coming. This lecture stands in, uh, instead of a more formal professorial inaugural lecture. It is somewhat to be regretted, I think, that the tradition whereby newly appointed professors give an inaugural lecture, that that tradition seems to have fallen by the wayside somewhat at Queen Mary. I think the last one I went to must have been eight, eight or nine years ago. Um, so we're having a series of lectures given by professors appointed over the last number of years that try to replicate the tradition of inaugurals, albeit without some of the ceremony and certainly without the robes that usually accompany those lectures. And in the context where our academic traditions and values are under increasing assault from a variety of quarters, the one thing we can do for ourselves is to reclaim some of what we value in those traditions. Um, and I think an inaugural lecture is one of those things. As I understand them, an inaugural lecture has a number of important benefits. The first, of course, is it's an opportunity to celebrate, to celebrate an outstanding academic achievements. And in the pressures of modern academic life, where we continue being pulled and pushed towards new projects and new goals, where everyone always asks you what comes next, such moments for pausing and celebrating are all the more important. And it also offers an opportunity for reflection for reflection on an intellectual journey and on the kinds of questions, themes and issues that have animated a substantial body of work over a long period of time. And such reflections can take many forms. Uh, I don't know what Kim is going to say about that. Um, but they allow us to stand back and to think about the shape of an academic career as well as its inevitable twists and turns. When done well, such reflections can serve to inspire us as well as to comfort us, to remind us of what is important and in some ways unique about what we do as academics and why we do it, and to remind us too that the path of academic life is sometimes not straight nor without its obstacles. And finally, by tradition, of course, inaugurals are public affairs. This means two things, I think. The first is that while there are many ways of engaging with audiences outside of the academy, we can and sometimes perhaps should be asked to give an account of what we are, what we're doing, uh, what we've done to a wider audience. An audience who may not be familiar with some of the details of the arguments we engage in, but who are interested in what the bigger questions and themes might tell us about how we should think about politics and international relations. And second, of course, the public nature of an inaugural means that we get to collectively celebrate with family, with friends, and with colleagues. So there are occasions where we hope we can put aside for a while whatever else we might have going on and enjoy a little time together. And goodness knows we need both the time together as well as the enjoyment that it brings. And so to Kim, someone advised me the other day not to just list the achievements that Kim has. And I realized as I was reading them through that actually sometimes a list is much more powerful than a description of the list. As all of you will be very well aware of the extraordinary academic contribution Kim has made over a sustained period of time. From the first book that I was aware of, the book on Kant, published in 1996, to a more recent project published this year, a monumental co-edited co volume on women's international thought. Sandwiched between these two books, are a remarkably wide-ranging and, in many cases, path-breaking set of contributions across what we would call theory, philosophy, 
and international relations, encompassing a concern with ethics, feminist thought, time and temporality, post-colonialism, violence, pacifism, and perhaps above all, what it means to be a critical theorist of global politics. Everyone will have their own favorite amongst this extremely long list, um, those that inspired or changed the way that we think. But while I've not read them all, um, and I did print out the list that's currently on our website, which runs to 10 A4 pages, uh, while I haven't read them all, in my experience, they're characterized by a seriousness of critical purpose, a humanist concern with what ways of thinking does or do to people in the world, and are written in a remarkably accessible and open style, one that welcomes the reader on a journey through a chain of thought. Kim has also been, as many of you will know, the most remarkable servant of academic disciplines in the United Kingdom. She serves as head of department at three uh, universities, first at the University of Edinburgh, second at the London School of Economics, and here, perhaps rather reluctantly, <laughs> for a year at the School of Politics and International Relations. She was a founding editor of the journal Contemporary Political Theory, a lead editor of the Review of International Studies, and most recently, Chair of the Politics and International Studies REF panel, having served previously as a panel member in the last REF. And of course, all this has indeed been recognised, as we are recognising it tonight. Kim was awarded the first Distinguished Contribution Prize by the British International Studies Association in 2015. She's been given two Distinguished Scholar Awards by the International Studies Association. And most recently, as again many of you will know, was given the American Political Science Association Okin Young Award for Feminist Political Theory for a co-author paper, co-author that is with Patricia Owens, called Women Thinkers and the Canon of International Thought, Recovery, Rejection and Reconstitution. And as many of you will also know, Kim has been and continues to be a mentor and supervisor to many early career scholars and PhD students, a number of whom we're lucky enough to have with us and quite a number of whom are in, in this room. This extraordinary set of academic contributions is only one of the reasons we're lucky to have Kim with us at the school. She has been, as all of you will know, an exemplary colleague, guiding the school with her characteristic good sense through the most difficult period in recent times, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and continues to offer advice and support to academic colleagues, as well as stepping in to take on sometimes onerous tasks. And on a personal note, I valued enormously her wise counsel and her support, as well as her fellow skepticism about strategies designed to transform universities. So in the end, so I want to end with a thank you, actually. A thank you to Kim, not just from me, but from the whole of School of Politics and International Relations. Thank you. So, it's enough from me. I want you to join with me welcoming Professor Kimberly Hatton. Thank you, uh, David, for those incredibly um, kind words. Uh, I sort of feel I should stop now and we should all go and have a drink because, you know, I'm great and you're all great and we could just have a fun time. But I suppose I'd better do the lecture now. I've uh, set myself the task of, of delivering it. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming, friends, colleagues, students. Um, as David very kindly did not say, it's nearly 40 years since my first work in higher education tutoring um, students in political theory and I think 1983 although my memory is getting a bit kind of vague about this stuff um, and I have been um, a professor for something like 15 years now um, and I'm finally getting to do an inaugural um, so this is this is very exciting and I should say that some people in the room have accompanied me through my journey from those PhD student days I fixed my BDI on two people in particular there um, I'm aware that I've had an incredibly privileged career in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and one of the key privileges uh, of having been able to do the work that I do over the years is that I'm constantly being 
made conscious of my own intellectual shortcomings in relation to many interlocutors, different interlocutors, sometimes long dead thinkers, sometimes contemporary colleagues, all of whom require me to think more clearly, more carefully, more inclusively than I may have done before. And in that respect, I would like to pay tribute to Queen Mary as a wonderful intellectual context over this past eight years, past eight years that I've been here. I've really valued the standard of intellectual exchange in the School of Politics and International Relations and more broadly uh, within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, I'm just going to mention one person, not anybody in the room, in terms of my intellectual interlocutors. Um, my PhD supervisor, who died very untimely when she was 15 years younger than I am now, but who remains for me one of the most brilliant minds that I've ever encountered and without whose inspiration I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, and that is Gillian Rose. Some of you may or may not be acquainted with her work, but I couldn't have an inaugural lecture and not at least mention her name. My academic training was in philosophy, uh, and since my first job in a philosophy uh, department as a philosophy lecturer at what became Wolverhampton University, I've actually worked in politics and international relations departments in Edinburgh, LSE, and then here at Queen Mary. Broadly speaking, I work in the fields of political and international theory and ethics. Uh, one focus of my teaching and my research work over the years has been the ethics of war and peace, of violence and non-violence. And it's on these themes that I will be speaking uh, this evening, with particular emphasis on the insights into war, peace and ethical judgment that I find in traditions of feminist pacifism. Oh, yep, it's worked. Um, so to put, it into, put this into context, since the end of the Cold War, there's been an absolutely massive explosion of work in the ethics of war and political violence, um, and also increasingly uh, uh, over the ethics of, of peace agreements and of the meaning of peace. Um, a lot of this has been played out in, in more popular kinds of contexts, but there's also been a huge, huge amount of academic work prompted by things like the conflicts in the 1990s, the breakdown of the Yugoslavian state and the wars that followed, the growth of the idea and to some extent the practice of military humanitarian intervention, the massive growth in UN peacekeeping uh, operations, all of which we saw in the 1990s. And then of course in the last 20 years, prompted by the so-called war on terror. Um, and the conflicts that have happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as in other uh, places over the past 20 years. It's also been driven to some extent by developments in technology, ideas about smart weapons, drones, killer robots, and all the rest of it. So we've had this huge flowering of work on war in general, but also specifically in the ethics of war. And if we look at what ethical theorists are doing in relationship to this, uh, this context of thinking about uh, war. They, the major kind of focus of the work that ethical theorists has been done has been to try to elaborate on and reflect on the criteria for justice in war, often traditionally separated out in justice in the causes of war, justice in the conduct of war, uh, and then increasingly there is work that looks at justice in the aftermath of war, so what counts as a just uh, peace. Beyond producing a lot of academic literature, of which this is a, a sample on the screen in front of you, ethical theorists and philosophers have also played a role in working directly with the military, in developing uh, military training packages, often on things like ethics in the conduct of war. Um, developing codes of conduct, etc. And we've had famous cases of public intellectuals such as Jean Bethke Elstein or, or um, Michael Walzer uh, pronouncing on the justice of the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, or people like Michael Ignatiev who sat on the commission that produced the report that led to the, um, the, the principle or doctrine of responsibility to protect. <clears throat> 
As Hegel noted a long time ago, there's a tendency for philosophical thinking to reflect the historical times in which it's situated, which I think also may explain how recently there's been a sort of turn in just war theory, often referred to as the revisionist uh, turn, pioneered by thinkers such as David Roden and Jeff McMahon, uh, which establishes criteria for justice in war through drawing analogies with circumstances in which individual killing might be uh, justified or not. The reason I connect this to Hegel's point about how philosophical thinking reflects its historical times is that this mode of just war theory, theorizing is much more easily able to justify the idea of war as a form of policing, war as humanitarian intervention, uh, war as preventive, and to make arguments for things like the use of selective assassination. More able to do this than more traditional approaches within just war thinking. So we've had this massive explosion of work, and as usual within it, there have been various academic debates, philosophical debates, surrounding these different aspects of how we establish justice in war, or what makes the difference between righteous and unrighteous conduct in war. Now, it's not my purpose here to evaluate the multiple arguments that have been made about the justice or otherwise of militarised conflicts over the past 30 years, but rather to point to how, even if there's a lot of disagreement within these literatures, the kinds of ethical arguments and judgments that this work has produced predominantly assume and reinforce a particular understanding of the relation and distinction between war and peace. It's essentially a binary model in which war and peace are understood as mutually exclusive concepts. And it forms an essential background for making the kinds of ethical judgment that predominant traditions in the ethics of war require. So what am I talking about with the war-peace binary? This is a, a particularly perhaps stark version of it in the work of uh, Proudhon from the middle of the 19th century. Um, I'll just give you a second to have a look at those rather robust uh, quotations. Now, I don't want to suggest that most ethical theorists now endorse Proudhon's enthusiasm for war, um, but I do want to suggest that some version of a war-peace binary that in some sense looks back to this kind of distinction is ubiquitous in ethical literatures. And without presuming such a binary, it would be difficult to make the claims of just war theory, which always have to assume that war has a beginning and an end, and that it can get things done, and that it is not peace. The whole sort of, uh, what, what uh, my student Eda will call sort of conceptual thought zone, is underpinned by this clarity of distinction between war and peace. War always appears, in a sense, as positive, as active. It's associated most obviously with an outbreak of kinetic violence, rupturing existing uh, continuum of peace, breaking out. It serves particular ends. It's in some sense productive. It's understood in linear and teleological ways. It's an instrument for making things happen, for getting things done. Whereas peace, well, not quite sure what peace really is. It's what happens when there's no war, has no particular purposes of its own. It's not very clear what it is, it's static. It's in some sense, as Proudhon suggests here, without life in terms of the ways in which it is, is conceptualized. So even if contemporary theory doesn't agree with Proudhon, I still think that the background imaginary of the ethics of war is dominated by this very clear-cut distinction between war and peace, with war understood as active, productive, and instrumental, and peace as something that is passive and static to be interrupted, and that doesn't really do anything very much. Uh, we see perhaps a bit of a distorted mirror image of that idea in some versions of pacifist thought in which peace takes on this kind of spiritual, transcendent, otherworldly kind of value, but again is understood in complete distinction uh, from war. However, if we look at what social scientists, uh, analysts of war and peace 
have been talking about for the last many uh, years, but certainly for the last decade, decade and a half, particularly in critical war uh, security and peace studies. This work persistently uh, challenges a binary understanding of war in relation to peace. Scholars in war and security studies have pointed out the prerequisites for war encompass much that goes beyond the battlefield, that the contours of war are continually changing, that relationships previously taken for granted between, for example, war and policing or war and the state are shifting in ways that are not compatible with this traditional understanding of war as something that has a beginning and an end and gets something done. In the meantime, peace studies scholars have been questioning negative understandings of peace, obviously for a, for a very long time. Uh, many people in the room will be familiar with Gautam's distinction between negative and positive uh, peace, uh, in which negative peace is understood as the absence of kinetic warfare and positive peace as the achievement of some kind of social justice. And it's interesting that in parallel with the ways that critical scholars have opened up the concept of war, we've also seen in critical peace studies a similar opening up of the concept of peace, in particular in the context of critical engagement with peacekeeping and peacemaking as, the, as they've been understood in the terms of the so-called liberal peace, which again some people will be uh, familiar with. Um, this is one example of a, a fairly recent book which tries to... Um, explore what it might mean to rethink peace away from the rather static negative understanding that has been traditional. In this volume, the authors argue against trends in peace studies, notably the tendency to reify peace as a static thing, to insert peacemaking and peacekeeping into a linear teleology governed by a particular normative end, identified with a certain package of institutions and rights and placed within a highly Eurocentric uh, narrative. I think they I would also say that they move away from a negative positive peace distinction as well, seeing Gautam's notion of um, positive peace as perhaps being too unhelpfully utopian, a kind of end of history thinking that actually reproduces the war peace binary. Instead, in different ways, the scholars writing in this volume argue that peace in zones of conflict, in the aftermath of kinetic phases of conflict, in the context of slow and structural violence, needs to be thought of as a process, a building of nonviolent relationships through a variety of everyday and private as well as public actions, speech and silence, including through processes of commemoration and aesthetic practice. The point here is not about non-violence understood strategically or tactically, but non-violence as a kind of quality of human interaction. And this more bottom-up way of thinking about peace articulates peace as imminent to conflict rather than transcending it. These kinds of arguments, just as I have said before about the war and security studies arguments, are disruptive of common sense understandings of peace as a kind of passive continuum which is interrupted by war and violence. So, what I'm suggesting is that critical scholarship on war and peace rejects clear-cut distinctions between them and the linear and determinate ways in which they've been traditionally, temporally and spatially framed. But this leaves us with a puzzle. How do we think about the ethical judgment of peace and war if peace and war are fundamentally imbricated with one another. As I've said, the, the masses of work on the ethics of war that we've seen over the last 20 and 30 years all relies on the idea that we can keep war and peace in separate compartments. Now, in terms of explicitly normative traditions of thinking about war, peace and violence and non-violence, I would go, I think, when trying to think about what ethical judgment of peace and war might mean if these two are imbricated with one another, to um, the rich philosophical resources um, that we find in the strands of pacifism most closely associated with anti-colonial anarchist and feminist thinking. 
I'm not suggesting that all pacifist thinking gets away from the war peace binary. I think some pacifist thinking absolutely, as I was saying about the distorted mirror of the Proudhon position earlier. Um, there are strains of thinking about pacifism and more broadly about nonviolence, in which nonviolent strategies are identified as the best way of achieving ends of peace, a way of thinking which places peace in the world to come, in this kind of future, and cuts against the critical insights of war and peace studies scholars that I've been referring to. Nor am I suggesting that all anti-colonial anarchist or feminist thought embraces pacifism. But in the intersection of these traditions, we find other ways of thinking about war and peace and other ways of conceptualizing ethical judgment. I'll speak very briefly about anti-colonial thought and about anarchism before going on to look more closely at feminism and the ethical and political implications of certain strands of feminist pacifism, which is my main sort of source of inspiration. But just briefly then, um, in terms of anti-colonial thinking, as, again, many of you in the room um, already know, anti-colonial thought recognises colonialism and imperialism, puts colonised societies on a constant war footing in which colonial control is explicitly and permanently secured through violence. And many would argue that in post-decolonial, whatever one wants to call it, in more contemporary times, that remains the case. This was very famously, of course, analysed by Fanon, and this analysis has served as foundational for arguments for violent as well as for non-violent resistance. Um, and are also bound up with arguments for um, thinking about political action to change the world as needing to be in itself in some sense prefigurative or exemplary of the world that you're trying to uh, achieve. Anarchist traditions point similarly to the war footing of state power. And similarly also we find justifications for both violent and non-violent responses to the warlike nature of what pretends to be peace. And this goes back to the Proudhon quotations as well. It's obviously one of the famous uh, influences in the tradition of anarchist thought. There are important clues in these traditions, I think, for what ethical judgment of violence might look like when based on a recognition of the mutual contamination of war and peace. But I want to dwell in more detail uh, on feminist pacifisms and their lessons for ethical judgment and political action. And that's what I'll go on to do now. So in philosophical terms, the history of feminist pacifism, pacifism can't speak, is often captured in a history of ideas that takes us from Jane Addams to Sarah Ruddick. On this account, feminist pacifism develops from strands of maternalist feminism rooted in the 19th century bourgeois model of feminine virtue that were an important element of feminist movements in Western countries in the early to mid 20th century. This kind of feminism was grounded in the idea of women's moral superiority, their peaceful and nurturing characteristics, providing a standpoint for the critique of masculine war and competition, which was highly influential uh, on pacifist and pacificist, <laughs> sorry about that technical term, forget it, national and international agendas in the interwar period. So if you look at the uh, images on the left, we have uh, an image of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which famously was uh, founded properly in the, in the wake of the First World War, but which followed from a conference on women and peace uh, held in 1915. And that's Jane Addams with the hat, uh, who is one of the most important thinkers associated with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, on the other side, we have Sarah Ruddick, who very, wrote a very famous book called Maternal Thinking, um, and whose work was quite influential, I think, on feminist pacifist activism in the anti-nuclear movements of the 1980s. So you've got a couple of images of Greenham, Greenham Common uh, there. Uh, most recently, the value-laden sort of binary gender divide characteristic of maternalist and care feminisms, or at least of some kinds of maternalist and care feminisms, has continued to be influential in the women, peace and security uh, agenda, which has very often been formulated in terms of women as the victims of violence and as having privileged insights into peace. Now, I think this narrative, while it has some, you know, value to it, uh, in many ways marginalises consideration of the theory and practice of feminist pacifisms in the majority world and of many grassroots women's peace movements that have developed in response to particular conflicts across the globe. 
It also tends to suggest that the story of feminist pacifism has a kind of uh, logic to it, a narrative. It, it's linear, it's delineated, and it moves in a certain uh, direction. This, I think, neglects the contingency, complexity, and fragility of the contextual connections made rather than given between feminism and pacifism at different historical moments. And I think it also makes it more difficult to identify the most valuable contributions of this diverse tradition of ways in which pacifism and feminism have intersected in different times and places. And I want to argue these are twofold. First, a diagnosis of the centrality of gendered relations of power to individual, collective and structural practices of violence from domestic abuse through to war. Second, a what I would call a this-worldly imagination of pacifism and nonviolence that does not wait for, but rather makes and practices an always uneasy and experimental piece and orients ethical judgment accordingly. When Russian forces escalated their war in Ukraine into a full-blown invasion in early 2022, a central narrative of Ukraine's mobilization was that men must fight and women, in particular mothers, must flee. It was noticeable that in the Western media coverage of this catastrophic event, no one questioned that men must become those that kill and die, and women must continue to do what we already know that they do, to care. This narrative is so much tied to the default gendered imaginary of war that it could not be questioned, even by those living in contexts such as the UK, in which the increasing involvement of women in the military has been held up as a sign of modernization. For feminist pacifists, war encompasses not only the political economy of war, the military industrial complex, and the centrality of the modern state to war as an institution, but also the ways in which war justifies and sustains the reproduction of gendered divisions of labor, relations of power and violence, and the ways in which gender divisions of labor, relations of power and violence justify and sustain war. As much feminist scholarship has shown, gender is embedded in war and war is embedded in gender, institutionally, practically, and discursively. This mutual embeddedness is inseparable, I would argue, from racialized and national identity hierarchies, which are frequently anchored and legitimated rhetorically and practically through value-loaded distinctions between heteronormative models of fem femininity and masculinity. Our very conceptualization of war relies on gendered reference points, from the meanings of war and peace themselves, to ideas and ideologies of state and nation, to notions of chivalry or the civilian. The gendered nature and effects of war and violence permeate peacetime. Everyday experiences of citizenship, labor, leisure, and family life, and continue to help constitute and police gendered, racialized, and national boundaries inside and outside of explicit, explicit instances of domestic, interstate, or interstate violence. For feminists, war does not happen in a defined space of combat, but is fought in and through a variety of forums, from the state's encouragement of women to breed for the good of the nation, to differential evaluation of aggression in feminized or masculinized children, to eligibility or otherwise for conscription. For feminist pacifists, war is part of a continuum of gendered violence that works through and links realms of intimacy and of organized military or paramilitary action. This diagnosis of the gendered nature of war and violence, sustained and sustaining binary models of femininity and masculinity, supports many different kinds of pacifist argument within traditions of feminism. If we go back to the case of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in the early decades of the 20th century, the politics of the pacifism of that organization were actually highly contested, ranging from an absolute rejection of war through to something much more like a kind of um, orientation towards disarmament, um, culminating in, in the uh, attempts by the League of Nations to bring armaments under control in the interwar period. Activists within the movement, such as Jane Addams, identified a contradiction in principle between feminist goals and the practice of war, 
Activists such as Helena Swanick were focused on the need for women's involvement in the democratic control of foreign policy. Activists such as Mary Church Terrell denied the possibility of promoting peace in a context in which the Versailles settlement left the imperial colour line intact. Assumptions and, um, and values underlying feminist commitments differed. For some activists within the League, there was an essential connection between women and peace. For others, that connection had been produced by women's exclusion from active participation in war. For some activists, feminism was about the achievement of legal equality, especially the franchise for women. For others, feminism was inherently linked to socialism and the transformation of economic relations. Neither the feminism nor the pacifism at stake were unitary positions. Nevertheless, the multiple connections made between feminist and pacifist positions reflected a common understanding that gendered relations of power are a significant element in the ideological and material underpinnings of the war system, and that peace could only be practiced and potentially sustained through challenging and displacing those relations of power. In both scholarship and political action, feminist pacifists have consistently called out the dependence of war and violence on gendered categories, practices, and structures. In doing so, feminists have unpacked the multiple ways in which war and violence are reproduced as everyday, common sense realities, and have brought their own experience in very different contexts to bear on the possibility of alternatives. Historically, those alternatives have encompassed many possibilities. Campaigning against particular instances of organised political violence, campaigning for international modes of conflict resolution, publicly affirming pacifism in war and peace, conscientious objection, non-violent modes of protest from strikes to civil disobedience, campaigning against the arms trade, anti-nuclear activism, setting up communities organised on principles antithetical to the militarised state system. But it's also included, as well as all these various practices, commitment to subvert the ways in which war and violence operate as a matrix for the generation of meaning and value, whether in confirming the link between citizenship and arms bearing, legitimizing the militarization of policing, or reinforcing gendered hierarchies through the production of accounts of what it means to be a hero. That thinking represents a strand of feminist pacifist practice that challenges and displaces the pervasiveness of violence and war, not by articulating an alternative political order and abstraction, but by experimenting with ways in which peace may be practiced even in a world still dominated by war and violence. Pacifism has often been attacked by both just war theorists and revolutionaries on the grounds that it purports to embody and pursue just ends, but is not prepared to take the kind of action through which those ends can be achieved, leaving it as not only ineffectual, but also hypocritical. However, such arguments rely on the assumption of the war-peace binary, assuming that pursuing just ends via violent means has no connection with the ends being served. The gendered analysis of violence and war points to the ways in which the practice of both, over and above the horrific costs on bodies and environments, actively instantiates and reproduces unjust hierarchies of power and preconditions of violence with effects that reverberate across the futures that just wars and revolutions were aiming to achieve. Feminist pacifism problematizes instrumental justifications and temporalities that assume that war and violence have a distinguishable before and after. In doing so, it also problematizes versions of pacifism that rely on an instrumental strategic logic. Feminist pacifism constantly reminds us that war and peace are not two neatly distinguishable opposing conditions. They're entangled with one another, and the boundaries between are messy and unstable. Peacemaking, like war-making, is always contaminated by its supposed other. A recent uh, volume, Feminist Solutions to Ending War, testifies to the multiple forms feminist pacifism can take in different contexts. And it's worth noting that in spite of the title, actually what all of the contributions to this volume are, are precisely not solutions. They are how you work in a context in which there is no solution. The cases range from feminist activism to resolve specific conflicts resulting from women's positioning within those conflicts, 
to peace education, to engaging with combatants as political subjects, to arguments for women's collective self-defense and the transformation of foreign policy. They encompass anti-nuclear activism, built on feminist, queer and indigenous knowledge, challenges to the nature and effects of war memorials, arguments for feminist economics and listening to women in the development of peace, peace initi initiatives as a way towards sustainable peace. The context of the cases include well-known sites of ongoing conflict such as Kashmir and Palestine, but also militarised settler colonial states and the indigenous communities within them. In spite of their ideological and empirical diversity, the different cases, the feminist solutions discussed in the volume, are connected by their understanding of collective violence as grounded in gendered, racialized, and colonial structures and relations of power and violence that don't continually manifest themselves in kinetic warfare, but that keep states and communities on a war footing. Peace is not made by reference to transcendent standards, but in and with the resources available in a world of war and violence, including resources that derive from women's different positionalities in relation to war and violence in different contexts. Efforts to make peace are not guaranteed to be successful or to avoid contamination by ever-present violence, and yet they not only represent but also instantiate the radical imagination of a different way of living. Commenting on feminist organizing for peace, Saray Aroni brings out the dual aspect of feminist pacifism as a practice that cannot be subsumed under goal-directed pragmatism or be narrated as a teleological story of women's progressively greater inclusion and success in peacemaking processes. She discusses her long-term engagement with feminist cross-community peace initiatives in Israel-Palestine um, and talks about how her experience has in many ways been one of failure in terms of hostile, including violently hostile, negative reactions of those uh, um, disagreeing with her and in terms of lacking, lack of success in meeting the goals of the peace movement. At the same time, she points to the quality of relationships forged with her fellow activists as an instantiation of peace and as a means of survival for an individual and collective political subjectivity oriented towards peace and capable of continuing to organize for peace. Matthias Thaler has spoken of the idea of peace as a minor grounded utopia. He goes on to stress that this type of utopian thinking and practice is distinguished by its linking of imaginative striving to everyday practices. This is, I think, a good way of capturing the nature of feminist pacifism. Feminist pacifism is a useful starting point for the ethical judgment of war and peace because it's premised on a deep understanding of the fact that there is no leap of transcendence or strategic plan, going back to strategic plans, that will take us beyond the permeation of politics by violence and war. There's only ongoing struggle to do things differently, deploying the resources that we have to hand. What this suggests for the ethical judgment of war and peace, I suggest, is the need for a much more thorough democratizing and provincializing of moral judgment. If peace and war are always intimately connected, then we learn most from the points of connection in which the agonism of their relation is most acutely lived. Peace is constructed in the push against martial, violent modes of relation wherever they are encountered. It's never a settled state, but always an ongoing struggle oriented towards building less, less toxic political relations into the future. If we go back to Proudhon's version of the war-peace binary and unsettle it, as I've tried to do, it forces us to think about peace as fundamentally active and as never pure. This is also, I think, how we need to think about ethical judgment in relation to war and peace not as the operationalization of a set of determinate criteria that tells you whether a war is just or unjust, nor as the articulation of sweeping general principles, war is always wrong, or whatever else they might be, but rather as the always imperfect practice of paying attention to the quality of relationships nurtured by violent or nonviolent action in specific contexts. This way of thinking takes the ethical theorist away from the moral high ground to the messy and contested low ground in which relations of war and peace are continually reproduced and also sometimes at least defied. Thank you.